Hey man, good morning. Good morning, guys. Good morning. We're on a little bit of a slope here, so everyone lean to your right. <laughs> so it'll test the uh, the validity of your chairs this morning as we're out here. But uh, I do want to lift you guys up. Thanks for being faithful and flexible during this time. Uh, I do want to dismiss our, our wonderful kids and our kids getting workers. We're gonna head across the street here to the enclosed uh, courtyard at the YMCA. So if you guys could make your way over there, you can look for Bill and Paula, Mr. Bill, Miss Paula over there. Miss Annabelle, have a great class. Yeah. Awesome. Well, God has given us a beautiful breeze and a beautiful weather and a, a beautiful slanted parking lot. And we're out here and we'll, we'll mix it up and we'll figure out the best. But uh, this is what we will be, we, we, we hope to do through, uh, if God gives us some warmer weather, uh, through November. That's kind of our hope is that we'll be out here. Uh, we'll figure out drive-ins and seating and all that kind of stuff. We'll just go from week to week. But uh, we do thank you for all that. We are uh, we are grateful to all of our medical professionals right here in the church as well as outside, just trying to do what's best for the greater good. Uh, but we love Southwest Virginia around this time of year anyway. We normally, when we're inside, we're looking out those windows wishing we were outside. So here you go. We, we get this. Uh, this is going to be a, a sermonian, which is a sermon and communion. And uh, it'll be a bit abbreviated since we are out here without cover. We will have our pop-up tents uh, next week. The New River has, uh, has purchased a, a large tent, a, a 40, 40 by 60 tent. Wow. That will be there. Uh, the Hutchins purchased that. Uh, Paul, the, the elder Hutchins, Paul and Jen. So they'll have a big, uh, pretty much a circus tent. Not for the, you know, circus tent for the church there. Rain or shine. And then we'll get our four, uh, our four pop-up tents, which really seem minuscule now. Uh, <laughs> get our pop-up tents and we'll figure that out uh, as the joke is our pop-up tents are just good enough to keep a two-liter cool uh, during our outdoor services so anyway uh, we are going through the book of Acts and we are in Acts chapter 3 uh, where this is the first miracle of the the, the church uh, obviously this miracle is a familiar one with the the lame man who's healed uh, Peter and John on their way to to temple in the afternoon uh, heal a, a man at the gate called Beautiful. We'll talk about that. But the title of my lesson this morning is uh, is simply the first miracle, but a small step for man and a giant leap for all mankind. Amen. You no, know, it was uh, July twentieth, nineteen sixty nine, where uh, Buzz and Michael and who's the other guy? Woody, Neil, William. Oh, Woody. Yeah, I think it's Michael. Yeah, Woody. <laughs> Michael Buzz and, and Neil uh, were the first ones to land on the moon. And the moon was often, or space in general, was often referred to as the final frontier. Like, where can we go as man? You know, once we landed on the moon, or once the Russians beat us to space, we won't talk about that too much. Uh, but once we were in space and landed on the moon, there was a sense of, you know what, we've, we've really ventured out. We've gone to the final front frontier. There's a huge step for all of mankind. And what we'll look at here is the church and, and Jesus' power uh, does, uh, does, does open up doors to all types of frontiers of change and renewal and reconciliation and, and doors are open beyond our wildest imagination. Here in Acts chapter three, as I battle the wind, we'll read just the first 11 verses. So again, First miracle, small step for man and a giant leap for all mankind. Now Peter and John were going to the temple at the time for prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon. And a man lame from birth was being carried up, who was placed at the temple gate called the beautiful gate every day so he could beg for money from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple courts, he asked them for money. Peter looked directly at him, as did John and said, look at us. So the lame man paid attention to them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, stand up and walk. Then Peter took hold of him by the right hand and raised him up, and at once the man's feet and ankles were made strong. He jumped up, stood, and began walking around, and he entered the temple courts with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the man who used to sit and ask for donations at the beautiful gate of the temple. They were filled with astonishment and amazement at what had happened to him. 
Yeah, we're going to look at this in uh, all the book of Acts here. And there's many miracles recounted in the book of Acts. But this one has a formal resemblance to the miracles that Jesus did in the Gospels. The, uh, the major difference in this, of course, is that this wasn't done directly by Jesus, but by his name, by his authority. And he's healed in the name of Jesus. You know, Luke uh, writes a familiar, or actually a rare word, uh, called halomai to describe the man's jumping. And it's a specific word that he chose intentionally because it's the same word that's found in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old, Old Testament, of a familiar verse that would have rung true in all of the Israelites that have worshipped at the temple, the disciples themselves, in Isaiah 35, verse 6, where it says at that point, the lame will leap like a deer. Referring to the Messiah, and when he comes, the, the mute will be loosened, the mouths of the mute will be loosened, the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the lame will leap like a deer. That same leap, that same word, halomai, is, is rare, and it's used specifically by Luke to usher in the sense that this is the Messiah. This is the great reversal of, of pain, of separation, of the walls, of hostility. When the kingdom of God shows up, these things change. And when Jesus came, there was an intention to healing the blind. There was intention to healing the lame. There was an intention to breaking down barriers of Gentiles and women. Because that was what the kingdom of God was always meant to be. And when the kingdom of God is there, these things change. The great role reversal is in full swing at this point. And Luke shows us that as he writes this, uh, this account. So the lame leap like a deer and the signs of Jesus and his power working in the world. And I love this sense that Peter and John, as they're going up to the temple, and this, this man says here that he was lame from birth. Literally means, in, in, in the Greek there, from the womb. That he was lame in the womb. And you've got to put yourself in this, this man's position. You've got to paint the picture in your mind's eye of even his life. And having been born, born lame, even his mother, you know, what's going to come of him? You know, if you had any siblings who maybe had fully functioning limbs, you know, what's going to happen to this man? You know, maybe his older brother took up the trade, but you know what? He's going to be reserved to be back at home with mom. And what's going to happen when mom and dad pass away, which inevitably, be, inevitably they would? What's going to come of this man? And all that could come from this man was that he found some good friends who took him to the place, to the temple gate, the beautiful gate, which was actually better and more valuable than any of the other gates there at the south entrance of the temple because it was covered in Corinthian bronze, which was better than the plated gold and silver that were on the other 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 doors. So a little, yeah, a little tidbit there for you. That's all free. But the sense of the beautiful gate, and it's intentional because it's in quotes there, and everybody knew this Corinthian bronze door, this valuable door, and what he's there and where he's sitting, it's intentional. Because there's three things, worship, prayer, and almsgiving, that the, the rabbis taught the Jews that this, these are your three-pronged function of being healthy as a Jew. You come to prayer, which was twice a day, and you worship, and you also give alms. So this man is there trying to seize the opportunity of a good Jew doing what he's supposed to and flipping him a coin on his way into temple or out of the temple. So this man is, is brought there every day intentionally to just get by and his whole life waking up what's going to come of it and i believe this day before he met peter and john was no different do you think this guy woke up this morning or that morning said you know what today is the day i take my first steps today is the day that i've been waiting for i'm going to start walking today i doubt it in his wildest imagination would he ever have thought i'm going to go to the temple and i'm not going to get coins this time someone's going to heal me I'm going to be able to experience something I've never experienced before. That's not in his mind. He's just looking to get by. He's looking to have enough. And we know from, an, a, from a disciple standpoint, this man's looking for gold and silver, the superficial, the things that won't uh, really make a difference in the long haul. And we know that Jesus and his power brings radical change and brings more than we could ever ask for, I imagine. But I think there's a challenge here for us. And there's a challenge here for me that we can resemble this man, maybe not in our gates or our legs, but we can resemble him with just kind of looking to get by. Looking to kind of just figure things out a little bit. To just get enough to make it through the day. And our expectations as to what the power of Jesus can do in our world and our lives, 
has been drastically minimized to, you know what, this is me just keeping on, keeping on. And this shows us, it shows me, that when Jesus' power comes in contact with the world, it's not just enough to get through the day. It's not just enough to kind of change your circumstances for a moment. It's not a, ooh, as Peter says, look at us. And this man looks intently back at Peter and John. What do you think is going through his mind? I haven't had many looks at all. At best, people kind of just flip a coin at me as they walk on by. But this guy is intently looking at me. Oh, this might be a generous almsgiver. This might be the best gift I've received all day. This beats the first round of prayer time. Six in the afternoon, maybe this will be a day that I get more than enough. Where I don't have to come back out here tomorrow. Mm. But I think the expectations were limit, limited. And what he heard from Peter and John, I believe with all my heart, he wasn't expecting to hear that. I think in the moments of, I don't have any silver or gold. How many times do you think he's heard that? Ah, I don't have anything. Sorry, buddy. I doubt they said buddy back then. But <laughs> sorry. I don't have anything. I don't have anything. I don't have anything. Like, okay. Silver or gold I don't have. And he's like, oh. And it just in a, in a moment could go from... To, uh, to what? You know, this is, this is the, the path that happens here in this moment. But you got to imagine the, the healing that went on. It says here that instantly, as Peter took hold of him and raised him up, I think this man was a bit, uh, you know, uh, you, you actually want me to stand? And Peter takes hold of him and raises him up. And it says at once in verse 7, the man's feet and ankles were made strong. It doesn't say anything about physical therapy, church. Amen. Come on. He doesn't say anything about, yeah, you know what? He raised up. He was really weak. And they took him to, you know, the temple trainers for five months to strengthen his ankles and his calves. I mean, think about it. This man's born lame from birth. How much width do you think this man's ankles and calves have? And how riddled was this man? Most likely, it wasn't just they were lame. They're probably mangled, too. Amen. I mean, they're stuck in a position. There's, there's nothing going on. There's, there's no movement. And it says here that his man, this man's ankles and feet were made strong. I don't know what that looked like. But paint the picture in your mind's eye. Picture his bones straightening out. Picture his calves just... <laughs> picture all of that. His ankles, you know, whatever it might be. His, his feet just, just changing. That the arc restored, the ligaments restored, the tendons tightening to a good, good degree. I don't know what that, what all that is, but imagine the muscles that are formed. All that in an instant. That's crazy. I mean, I, I had shoulder surgery six years ago, and uh, I had, I was, my arm was, was, uh, was in a sling. Doug knows this, and some other you guys do too. But that, my arm was in a sling for like six weeks. And the atrophy that occurred in six yeah, weeks yeah. of not moving my arm mm. was ridiculous and very surprising to me. So that I went to physical therapy for the first time and my PT doctor laid me down. He's like, okay, here's what we're gonna do today. And he gives me a pink, I knew it, a pink two pound dumbbell. <laughs> I said, okay, John, this is gonna hurt. I was like, really? He's like, lay down. I want you to grab this dumbbell here and then just move it out like this. And in my mind, I was like, man, no problem. I was like, <laughs> I mean, I couldn't move it. And when I did get it to that point, I was exhausted. And the humility that rushed over me. I was like, Doc, does it have to be pink? <laughs> it's already, you know, the two is already enough. <laughs> But six weeks of not moving my arm, and that, like, ugh, and that, and I, I did physical therapy for five months. And five months didn't get me back to where I was. It got me to a point where I could just kind of function. And then there was strengthening on top of that. I didn't feel back to myself for a good year and a half. And this man, from birth, never used a muscle. And boom, now he's not just walking, not just going to physical therapy, but he's walking and jumping and leaping. Yeah. You don't leap after not using a muscle. Some of us, you know, this time of year we have flag football and some of the guys who 
think we were sorely overlooked from, you know, Division One football back when we were younger. We tried to go out there and play some flag football. And all of us who have been walking our whole lives and we're athletic to a degree, we go out there and we start leaping around and we hurt ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And this man never did it. And it doesn't say, yeah, he leapt and then pulled a hammy. He leapt and then realized, ooh, that wasn't a good idea. I went too fast. I went too far. This, this whole group, the temple recognized this guy, that guy was laying, that guy was sitting there, that's the guy asking for alms every day, in and out, and now he's here in the temple, which is a whole other point, in the temple, leaping, and they're amazed, and they're filled with astonishment at what happened to him. This is what happens when Jesus, in his power, comes into our lives. Amen. And this seems a bit mystical and fanatical, like, oh, yup, it's a miracle. Well, it's a miracle because you can't explain it, and that's okay. But I think as disciples, and in my heart, we kind of limit, like, oh, yep, that's a cool instance to really just prove the validity of the church. That's cool. And we kind of sideline it to kind of these formation moments for the church. And then we minimize God's power in our lives. Like, oh, yeah, that was back in the day when they're really just trying to get on their, their feet and really show that Jesus has risen. But Jesus' power is the same today as it was then and yesterday. It says the power that raised Jesus from the dead, this, that spirit lives in us. So I ask myself and I ask us, the church, what are our expectations of Jesus' power in our world? What limits do we put on God's power? Now I'm not saying let's all walk out of here and say, you know what, in the name of Jesus walk again i think there's some apostolic gifts going on here which is a, a midweek lesson right. we talk about that that's right. but there's an expectation and there's a faith that's combined with who has the power who the giver is it's jesus as the giver and he has the power and there's no limit to what he can do because i know this about jesus jesus came to restore everything back to the way it was supposed to be amen every illness will be cured Every sickness will be eradicated. Every muscle will be strengthened. Every eye will be opened. Every tongue will be loosed. This is what the kingdom of God will be. This is what's supposed to be happening to those who carry the name of Christ. Mm. That there is a great reversal, whether it's physical, but definitely spiritual. And we've got to answer that question. You know, what, do I, what do I expect on a day-to-day -day basis? What do I expect when it comes to Jesus' power and what he can do. Again, I joked, this man didn't think today's the day I walk. But God tells us in Ephesians chapter 3 that, that what we ask or imagine is nothing in comparison to what God can do. That's right. The voice says, in your wildest dreams, the voice translation. I think, yeah, that's a nice crochet, a nice crocheted pillow on our guest rooms. But this is true. This has got to be true in our lives. That God can do more than I can even imagine. And what might that be? You know, this man does find not just physical healing, but spiritual acceptance. When he was told he wasn't worthy to go into the temple, now he's there. Crossing the threshold of the Gentile court, going into the temple, worshiping God for the first time. He was told he was not acceptable. And now he not only has physical healing, but what I believe he was super excited about was the spiritual acceptance he experienced for the first time. Amen. Amen. Walking through those doors and being seen as a new creation. And the joy that comes from knowing that those who rejected him, those barriers he experienced for a lifetime, were now gone. And that's truth as well for those who are in the kingdom of God. This lame beggar, the Ethiopian eunuch, the Gentile, the woman at the well, all those barriers come crumbling down when the kingdom shows up. And Peter and John bring the kingdom with them. They show up in this barrier of physical, physical challenges and then social and spiritual denial are flipped on its head. And this man's a new creation, both physically and spiritually. This man had been living for countless years in survival mode. If I can just get enough today, and I ask us as a church, and I think it's relevant all the more to this COVID era that we're in, is that I believe many of us, spiritually, are in survival mode. Our expectations are low. 
We're caught up in the physical realm of limitations. We're consumed with the climate of our, of our country. Yeah. Not to the point of just being able to have social awareness, but completely wrapped up in it that it dictates your heart, your actions, your That's mindset. Right. That's right. What you do, who you do it with. Mm. That there are barriers that we've allowed to creep and grow in our lives when it comes to what can change, who can change, and when they can change. Wow. That we think, you know what, being a disciple, and I've been a disciple for 19 years, and I'm, I'm number one in line. I'm not... I'm right here. But you know what? I've seen some great things as a disciple. But I don't wake up every day on the edge of my seat waiting to see God show up. I'm resolved to the normal day of ministry, the normal phone calls, the normal studies, the normal interactions, the normal tasks, the day in, day out. I'm not even talking about mundane. These things are exciting in a lot of ways. But kind of like, yep, this is it. This is it. This is what it is. How many of us have said that? It is what it is. What it is. Uh, you look at your job and you say, yeah, I mean, just like this is it. You know, this is my life. I go to work, punch in, punch out, same coworkers, same conversation, same thing. And, and maybe, maybe you have a thought of like, yeah, it'll get better. It'll get better in the long run or one day, you know, it'll be better. But by, by and large, if you really look at your thought process, perhaps we're just in survival mode. We're just kind of getting through it. Or maybe we look at this season, I know I have, like, let's just get through the season and then, and then we'll see what comes to things. Yeah. And these low expectations of, of the church, low expectations of one another, low expectations of our God, low expectations of what can happen in our community. This man was that way every day. Let me just show up to the temple get what I need to to get some food in my belly, get what I need to to keep paying whatever I need to pay, and then tomorrow I'll do it all over again and hope for the best. Is that us? Is that you? Is that how we see our lives? I'm talking to the disciples. Like, if you're not a disciple, Jesus, I, I get it. It, it. it is mundane. It is. Wow, what's my purpose? It, my job was what I was always excited about, and now I have it. It's like, oh, you know, it is what it is. But as a disciple, have we shrunk have we had spiritual atrophy in our expectations? Where it's like, you know what? I've kind of been stuck in this spot for a long time. And you know what? I'm just getting by. My marriage is where it is. And yeah, I don't like where I'm at. But you know what? I'm getting enough from God. I'm getting enough from the church. I'm getting enough from my time with God to just hang in here. Is that us? Is that you? We've been there. You've been there. And unfortunately, we'll be there again. But when the kingdom of God, this, this, the kingdom of God shows up. And sometimes it needs to be someone who's not us showing up in our lives. You know, we're all going to be in a spot where we're there. And we need a Peter or John. We need someone who knows what power lies in Jesus to say, look at me, bro. Look at me. This is what can happen. Pay attention to this. This can be reality for you. It's not me. I'm not giving it to you. It's not my strategy, my plan, my, my, my strength. But it's Jesus. And really, Peter and John, as they reference Jesus' name, that means so much more than what we understand as Western, Westerners. When someone evokes someone's name, it was like their power, their character, everything about them is in the moment right here. Wow. You know, we say things like, oh, well, if Jimmy were here, he would do this. That's kind of the closest thing we've got. Is that we kind of like hark back to a memory of someone we love that's not here. It's like, what would they do? Those bracelets back in 1998, what would Jesus do? It's kind of like the best. But even that, it's like, well, what would Jesus do? But I'm going to do it. This is Peter and John saying, Jesus is going to show up through his name. All of his authority, his character, his strength, power is going to be right here to heal you. And later, we didn't read it, but Peter and John are like, why are you surprised this happened? It wasn't us. I didn't do it. The very character, the very power, the very nature of Jesus was here and did this. And that's the kind of power that lives inside of us. And we need people 
faithful people in our lives that understand that power to remind us of what we have and what can occur. What can change in your marriage? What can happen at your job? What can be removed from our lives? What stubborn sin can be eradicated? What long-standing challenge can be to be, can be flung out to great strength? But I find myself limiting God, not because he can't do it, but because this is kind of how I think it's going to be. I'm resolved to think this is as best as it's going to be. And if I can get through today, awesome. But it's time for us to shift our mindset. You know, this man took a small step, and it was a big step for him. But what this shows to a greater degree is that this was a giant leap for mankind. That this one man's transformation shows us that there's so much more to be had for the whole world. That this man's physical restructuring and healing is a sign to something so much greater that's available for all mankind. Come on. Yes, it was huge for Buzz and Michael and Neil to land on the moon. And that's great. But it showed there's so much more out there. There's so much more that we were capable of. And people say, let's not stop at the moon. Let's go farther. Where else can we go? And we're still sputtering around Mars and things like that. But it launched research. It launched NASA. It launched all these federal programs. You name it. It, it was where else can we go? And I believe when we're reminded of what God has done, yeah. when we look at what he's done in our lives, we don't say, well, I guess that's it. I guess the moon is as far as we'll go. You know, we did it. Let's settle. It's we got there. Where else can we go? So if you're a disciple of Jesus, you have undergone the most radical transformation of being separated from Christ to now being in him, created like him, receiving an alien righteousness, not of your own, restored, regenerated, and yes, the bumps and bruises and the swelling and your ankles might not work. Your legs might be getting weaker. But we're talking about a giant leap for mankind, which means that real refreshment, real change, real transformation, eradication of sin, reconciling relationships, the walls of hostility, of racism, prejudice, and, and division can be raised to the ground when the city of God shows up. When those who have the power of Jesus in them, that point to the power of Jesus in them and for others, these things can happen in our day. And this isn't just nice speak. Our world needs this more than ever. Our world needs to take a giant leap forward. And the what, what we're going to look at Acts and what we see here in Peter preaching, we'll study this out a little bit more later, is that Peter says, don't be astounded, don't be surprised. This is what happened. And as we take communion, he references this idea that this, this Jesus who we just evoked is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's been here from the beginning. Oh, and by the way, he was holy, and he was the righteous one, and you killed him. It says in verse 15, you killed the originator of life. So there's a responsibility. And he goes on to say, we were witnesses to all of this. And it was on a basis of faith that this man you see now is healed. And he goes on to tell them more and more about how this was supposed to be from so long ago. And the highlight that we get to have this morning is in verse 19, this giant leap for all mankind, that we can repent and turn back to God so that our sins are wiped out and times of refreshment may come from the Lord. Amen. What's the giant leap for us as a church? It's the gift of repentance. What's the giant leap that we get to have in our hearts and our souls? Repentance, real change. Whatever's going on can be done away with in the power of Jesus. Not your strength, but the giver who is God can change us from the inside out. This man's ankles and legs are meant to be nothing more than a sign of what can occur to a greater degree in your lives. So I fear that we're in survival mode kind of in our lives, and it's time to break out of that and, and be renewed to say, you know, what, what can happen? And to believe that. 
And maybe you are like Peter and John, where you are like, you know what, there is power. I'm a witness to all that. And you're the one that needs to show up in my life or someone else's life. To not be the, the bearer of that power, but point to the one who has it. To tell the story. You know, we often think practically in terms of what we don't have. We think of, you know, well, who am I? I can't do this. I see so many needs in our city. Who am I? I can't meet that need. I can't do that. I don't have that. But it's time to stop thinking about what we can give and start thinking about the giver. Yeah. To practically have the giver in our minds. Not what we can't or can't give. Give what you can, but recognize the greatest gift is to point to the giver who is God. Amen. And we will see practical changes in our community. But it starts with the people of God. It starts with his church to no longer look at the world like, oh, okay, I'm settled. It is what it is. To no longer look at your discipleship and your relationship with God as, okay, I guess this is as good as it's going to get. I'm getting pretty comfortable with these certain sins in my life. I'm getting pretty comfortable with this type of status in my marriage. I'm kind of getting comfortable with this kind of relationship with my kids, their spiritual development. I'm kind of getting comfortable with the way the world looks and yeah, I need to change and blah, 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 blah. But you know what? It is what it is. I can just kind of make it through this season, make the best of this. The church needs to say, you know what? All things are possible. Amen. Things can change quickly. Amen. If someone's ankles and legs can just be restored to a point where they can leap just like that, we've got to believe that our world can change. But it starts right here. The great leap that we can take as a church is for each and every one of us to recognize the power God gives us to repent. You know, right now in the Jewish cal calendar is the 10 days of awe. And it's at this calendar in the harvest season, I think God lines it all up, lines it all up this 10 day of awe as they look to the, the Feast of, of Booze or the Feast of Tabernacles. is a time in the Jewish calendar where everyone is recognizing, okay, Yom Kippur is coming up. And Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement where the once a year the great high priest would go into the temple and sacrifice for all of Israel. And there was a worthiness that the, the Jews strove for by recognizing when the time of atonement comes, I want to have reflected on how I'm really doing spiritually. I want to take every, every moment to really take a deep dive into how's my heart? How's my faith? How's my life? Is it in alignment with God's will? So that when the day of atonement can come, I can celebrate with not my ability to figure it all out, but celebrate with the giver who gave me life, who washed all my sins away for the upcoming year, or for the past year rather. Now we know we've got it way better than that. No we don't have to shake in our boots and say, did I reflect enough? Did I reflect enough? Am I grateful enough? Then you go to the temple, you're like, ooh, am I in the book of life? Am I in the book of life? If you've experienced repentance, you're baptized into Christ, you don't have to tiptoe around. You've experienced regeneration. You experienced the full degree of God's power, and now that's meant to free you up. Free you up to change. It says here that God's kindness, in Romans 2, God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. That kindness has been displayed on Jesus, in Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. We have all so practically, repent. Take this time to reflect on how we're doing spiritually. Have we settled? Where have our sights set? Where do we need to see people come into our lives and remind us of the power that we have in our hearts? Who do we need to help? Recognize there's more to life than this. To reestablish and realign our hearts that, you know what, disciples of Jesus, it's not meant to be a boring life. It's not meant to just show up to work and clock out and then come back home and put something in the microwave and, you know, I made it. We're not meant to kind of trudge around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're meant to live lives of purpose. Amen. We're meant to just be out there and see what God's up to today. So let's repent of anything that holds us back. Let's repent of things that are weighing us down, things that, that are, are, are really tripping us up, as Hebrews 12 tells us. And let's get after recognizing the power that is in all of us.
and what could happen. So while this man woke up and never expected to walk again, his expectations were changed forever. The sad news is this man's name was never mentioned in scripture. You know what that means? He didn't make it. If this man was known by the church, his name gets in. You'd think the early church would know this guy. This man that was born lame and went in the temple. But he's just listed as a man. And whenever you see that happen in scriptures, it's because that guy was like the like the ones who the the beggars, or excuse me, the lepers that came back and only one was grateful. It's that type of parable, that type of reality. Is that this man experienced great power from Jesus and just let it fade away? What did he do? Maybe he went back and did all the things he wished he could have done his whole life. I don't know. But it's a glorious moment, but it's a tragedy all the same. The truth is, for my heart, man, I want to repent. I want to change. I want to grow. I want to experience the power. I don't want to be a guy that's experienced the power of God only to settle and go after lesser things. Or sit and think, well, this is it. And miss out on the power of God. It starts here in the church, and I'm excited about that. And there's so much that will occur in our hearts first as we look to change the world. But that's what it's always meant, and we're reminded of that here. That we take little leaps or small steps here as a church. It will be a giant leap for our community, for our world, as the church changes and grows and repents. And the world sees God in his great restoration and restore of our world. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, heaven, God, thanks so much for this story. The story of this man who was born lame, had nothing going on. And honestly, made good out of it for as long as he could. You know, this man having friends, him getting to the temple, him getting a couple coins here and there. Uh, we may look at this man's story and say, well, he could have stayed home and kind of just faded away. But you know what? He, he had some initiative. But there's so much more that he had no idea was coming his way. And God, we thank you for Peter and John and their faith to evoke your name, to recognize your power and its limitlessness, that this man can have his physical, his legs and ankles restored to the point where he's leaping right away. God, help this miracle resonate, or res you know, resonate deeply in our hearts and our minds to recognize that when your power comes into play, things can change radically and quickly. Help us to repent of our stagnation, to repent of our, uh, the barriers that we put up to your power the things that we've accepted in our world, in our own hearts, in our own church. God, help us to see that your power can eradicate those things, change those things, strengthen those things. Whatever it is, our marriages, our families, our relationships, any bitterness can be reconciled and dealt with. Any sin can be repented of and forgiven. All those things are available to us because of Jesus. Help us to seize that opportunity and help our expectations of what you're up to to be right where you want them to be. I pray for us as a church that we could change, that we can repent first, to take small steps so that giant leaps can be made for our world and our community as we partner with you to see all the curses and all the challenges and all the pain reversed in the kingdom of God. We love you. Bless our time of reflection and community here. We ask this in your son's name.